The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Do we have a working relationship with the other side? What powers do our loved ones possess to love and protect us and warn us of danger? And do we need special abilities to hear those warnings and a, a belief strong enough to act upon them? Our guest today is Janice Golf, who has been on the show s- several times before. She's experienced many encounters in her life with aspects of the other side. And one of the most powerful and meaningful experiences was when her deceased father came back to motivate her to protect her mother from the ravages of Hurricane Katrina as it swept through Louisiana and Mississippi in late August 2005. It's estimated Katrina ranks in the top five of the most deadly, damaging, and expensive natural disasters ever to hit this country. And Janice's aging mother was in the path of destruction even before Janice, who was living in Arizona by then, knew the storm was about to hit. And that's when her deceased father warned her of what was to come. And to tell us the story from her home in Rimrock, Arizona, is Janice Goff. Janice, welcome back to NDE Radio. Good morning, Lee. Good morning. Good morning. Good good to hear your voice. So, 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 Janice, tell us about where you were and what happened when your dad's warning came concerning your mom in the hurricane. Well, it was um, Saturday. And Saturday morning, I was getting ready to for a real estate show to um, show some property. I'm walking through the house, going to my computer room, and an incredible thing happened. Right before me, I saw the air open up like curtains would open up. Mm. And Daddy's voice blasted through this air. We, we think it's so dense, and it's... I mean, we think it's nothing, you know, but it's got to be something. Um, his voice blasted through this opening and went into my head and down my spine, and he screamed at me, go home now. Well, it just dropped me to my knees. I fell on the floor. My spine was just like I had been hit by lightning. And it took me just a few minutes to kind of get it together. I'm screaming and crying and crawling to the back door. To Kenny and Matt were out there in the garage uh, working on a vehicle. And when I was able to finally get to the door and pull up on it and get the door open, I screamed at them. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of like a screaming thing going on. You know, I'm going to Mississippi in an hour, make it happen or go with me. Mm. And now, Kenny's, Kenny's, we should explain, is <laughs> your your husband and, and Matthew's your son. Yeah, they're kind of like stunned, um, not knowing what's happening, but I didn't, I had no idea either. And Kenny started, uh, you know, giving me a lot of excuses. Wait, wait, you know, we what, 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 you know, because this was totally unplanned. Mm. And Mississippi is, you know, a good 38-hour drive, you know, this sort of thing. We were totally unprepared for this. Um, And I told Kenny, I screamed at him again, I'm going to the bank to get some cash, be ready to go when I get back. Mm. And he still, wait, wait, you know, and I (laughs) I screamed again at him, go with me or make it happen. Mm. Um, So... Before I got back inside, I heard Kenny say it must be the hurricane. And I had no idea there was a hurricane out there. I don't watch the news. And, I, you know, I just, we burn candles at both ends. So I was, I'm always really busy. I just didn't have a clue there was a hurricane out there. Mm. So we bundled up. I ran to Camp Verde to the bank, got back, and they were, Kenny was ready to go. When I got back and we loaded up and left, wow. we drove straight through and somewhere in Texas, I stopped at a, we stopped at a gas station, Odessa, Texas, I believe it was. And, um, 
bought all the gas tanks they had, you know, the gas cans, and filled them up with fuel and uh, diesel and unleaded. We run diesel. My sister runs unleaded. And then at the next stop in Junction, somewhere down the few more hours, you know, we did the same thing. So we had a truckload of fuel that we were carrying in the back of the truck. Um, by the time we got to New Orleans that morning, on Sunday morning, another incredible thing happened. <laughs> we were going east on 10, and when we got to New Orleans, we were the very last vehicle they allowed to go east on the interstate, and martial law was set up. So oh, the so interstate was closed wow. on Sunday. And then we were in bumper-to-bumper traffic for mega, mega hours trying to get on to Ocean Springs and, and Biloxi area there on the coast. My intentions were to get my mother and her little dog and take her to my sister's in Alabama. Um, but after seeing what we were going through there, there was no way we were going to be able to get out. There was too many vehicles. Um, and then, of course, Katrina hit Monday morning. And, you know, this is one of the first hurricanes we've ever experienced down there that hit during the daytime. They all come at night. So we worked like Trojans all Sunday after we got there and to get prepared. Mom has a two-story house, so we put axes upstairs and filled all the bathtubs with water and... <coughs> Just we did everything. We sandbagged. We did everything just at mega speed, trying to get you know going there. So, um, but <laughs> I it was such a whirlwind, Lee. It was just uh, it was mind blowing. Hmm. And then after Katrina hit, we had no contact with anybody for several weeks. All the cell towers were down. Of course, no communication. There was no fuel. There was no way to get off the coast. Everybody back here in Arizona had no idea if we were dead or alive because they were watching the news. We had no news. We didn't know what was happening. So, and just, you know, many, many things happened down there. We were down there um, over three weeks before we could before Bush got enough fuel on the coast, you know, for people to start moving around, and mm -hmm. we were able to get out of there. I uh, caught a policeman walking down the road. That's all you could do at that time. It's two and a half weeks later. Um, and went and begged her to let me use her cell phone to call home. <laughs> and she did. And my son, Matt, here, running our business and trying to hold, you know, everything down. Um, he didn't answer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the only one call I could make, and he didn't answer. But when I heard his voice on the answer machine, I just I just squalled. You know, I just broke down crying. Uh. It was like you hold up for so long. We had seen so many, so much death, so much destruction. Um, and to hear his voice was like, salvation you know so uh, but i was able to tell him we were fine and we were gonna you know be trying to move off the coast within a week or so yeah thank god for answering uh, machines exactly exactly <laughs> Now oh, you well. took uh, you you had the presence of mind or kenny did to take down take some uh, chainsaws with you and some equipment we did he threw he threw a chainsaw in the back of the truck i mean we've been through hurricanes all our life so we we kind of know the routine uh, propane tanks you know we only had one chainsaw put it in there and mm -hmm. we had put uh, our truck up in the garage and put it up on the ramps to get it up off the once you were there level off yeah. the ground um and Daddy built that house on the high, one of the highest hills on the coast. We've never had water up on that at that house, but this time it came off the ocean there, off the Gulf. You know, with such intensity, we we had a foot of water in the yard, maybe two feet, which meant our neighbors next to us had 25 feet of water. 
So they wow. were totally flooded out and on top of the roof and up in the trees, you know, whatever they had to do. I think one of the things that really surprised me when we got back was literally watching TV and watching the news and the flashbacks of all that, knowing what we had been through to get there and to maintain through that hurricane, um, hearing about all of the conflict with why people couldn't get out of New Orleans. And I'm like, well, they never once said, not one time, they closed the interstate down on two, on Monday, I mean Sunday, the day before Katrina hit. Those people couldn't get out. They blocked them in. And I think the reason they did that was because there was no place for anybody to go. Mm. They, that, I think that was the way they kept them in place so that there wasn't, you know, 100,000 people on the road in vehicles trying to go somewhere and getting caught in that mm-hmm. hurricane and, and just having more deaths and more mega destruction with all of the vehicles being thrown around. This, I'm not uh, this sure. is, I just don't know why they didn't yeah. cover that. This is, uh, you know, besides your, your, your father's warning, which is fascinating, um, this is a really important story because it tells people what to expect when some other catastrophe may hit. I mean, if we had a, I don't know, a nuclear explosion or a, um, a, a nuclear plant melted down or there was some huge terrorist activity of some sort, we might, you know, everyone thinks, well, I'll just get in my car and go. But <laughs> first of all, right. they may close There's the roads. Many people trying to go and yeah, they will, they will close it, the roads. Right, and people who don't plan on bringing extra gasoline, they run out of fuel and maybe they stop in the middle of the road and then all the traffic behind them is backed up. I mean, it could be such a nightmare. Did you take any food with you when you went? Oh, no. Um, We have at Mom's house, we had, uh, we're totally prepared under every bed, uh, in every back corner of every closet. We have food, we have water, drinking water. Um, we, you know, we're totally prepared in that way. We've been through it so many times. And your comment, Lee, is real important. Even here in the middle of Arizona, we have one road in and one road out, and that's I-17. If we have a truck strike in Phoenix or a truck strike up on I-40, our, our four or five grocery stores are emptied out in a heartbeat. You don't mm-hmm. want to be in that we saw uh, at Walmart they had brought ice in, and we saw a daughter actually shoot her father over a bag of ice. People lose their mind. Oh so I'm not into fear factor and not into, um, you know, just running rampant with fear about all the what, all the what ifs. But anything can happen in Phoenix. Those people are going to migrate north. We're totally prepared to stay right here where we're at, and we're totally prepared to share what we have with the, you know, the two streets around us with the people mm-hmm. here. With your neighbors. So, uh, yeah. I want to go back yeah. and explore a little about your dad's warning, because what if, uh, you know, it seems like this is a very unusual circumstance that, you would be warned so dramatically by the other side. And why, if that's possible, if it's possible for uh, a deceased relative to pass on a warning when catastrophe is coming, why doesn't that happen more often? You know, I. <laughs> it seems like our conversations are just filled with questions, questions, you know, and no, not a lot of answers. Um, Mom and Dad's relationship was so incredibly close. It was never just Othre, which was my dad's name. Othre's doing this or that. It was always Jane and Othre. Mom and dad were totally crazy about each other till death do us part. And they're, um, they were probably the, the best role model for husband and wife that I could have ever had in this whole world. I think love is so endearing and so strong that it crosses 
all barriers because this happened again and it was all about mom and she had given away his drill press and he built that house with that drill press and dad woke me up in the one morning real early and said get my drill press back in my garage (laughs) and after you know it's like god daddy that's just a thing you know but after really considering that I didn't know at that time mom was going to start losing her memory. And the thing that she had around her helped her mind and helped put her back in place in her mind. He knew that that drill press was attached to a memory that they shared. And it was very important to have that there for her. This was all about mom. Every time, all about mom. And... I think that, I do think that that love is so much stronger than anything we can really comprehend that that allowed dad to break that barrier and do what he needed to do to take care of her because that was his promise. Yeah. Some people believe that um, ghosts stay around in the form of spirits because they're confused or um, they don't realize that they, that they've died. But in your dad's case, and probably in many other cases, people are attached to something like through his love of your mother. And so they stay on purpose. They know they can go on, but they they hang around for a while. I know you you took at least one picture where he, after he died, appeared on on the side of the picture. And uh, so it it seems like he was almost uh, present there, I guess, until your, your mother died. Yeah, and that was not a ghostly picture. No. He literally in body um, or or showed himself in the body that he was in while he lived here. Um, his shirt that he had on, his blue jean shirt, mom made that shirt. His belt, his jeans, they were still hanging in mom's closet, and this was over two years later. Um Just an amazing amount of things. But, you know, it was always my impression Dad wasn't, quote, hanging around and still present here. It was my impression that he had gone and he was doing whatever he had to do, but he came back when he needed to. So I don't know if that's the same idea as um, a haunted house where ghosts Mm. are hanging out and in residence. I never felt Dad was in residence, but that he was there coming and going as he needed to be. Well, um... I I just think there's a lot of options on the other side once we leave our body, and I don't know that we can put them all in a little box. Right. Now, I know you've encountered ghosts. You you did in that hotel. I think we talked about it on a previous show. Um... So you don't you don't see that as being similar to your father's situation. I I don't. I I feel like that was almost like looking into another time, um, maybe a time warp. The Death Valley um, area is very uh, different energetically than anything else, and when you look out across the sand and the desert out there, and you see the heat waves that come up from the earth that are visible, it's almost like you can see the another dimension there if you're, if you're looking. And I, I just felt like a portal had opened up or just another dimension just manifested right before our eyes. It, it was totally mind-bending, those weeks that I spent out there during that burrow roundup. A little, I came back very, um, it was very hard to get back into just, you know, it's only a couple hours away, but it was very hard to get back into regular life. Once you um, experience so much of that, the brain (laughs) wants to turn off. You're either going to stay there in those thoughts or you're going to come back and put it behind you and move on. And it took me a little while to shift and 
get back into regular life, you know, <laughs> I, you feel like you're bordering on really literally bordering on crazy because it's hard to, it's like walking between two worlds. You said one time to me, too, that you'd walked up to that haunted hotel in Jerome and saw a woman in Victorian dress standing out on the steps and uh, yeah. thought it was a costume uh, event a costume until you realized or something. Yeah, <laughs> until she disappeared. And just just faded away. So, you know, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't have any answers. Why would I see that? Why would I be there in that very moment to, to observe that? And would she have been there if nobody had been there to see her? Um, it's kind of like when a tree falls in the forest, if no one's there to hear it, mm -hmm. does it still make a sound <laughs> kind of thing? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, well, it's interesting to think that these might be, might be time warps <laughs> that, um, that either they think they're in a different era or you have suddenly a window into the past, and I then heard, if that's I, the case, do we do we also have windows into the future? Can we see can we see uh, future events that uh, are happening before our eyes as well? I wonder um, the great inventors um, and the great minds like Einstein and you know all the all the old great inventors, um, Leonardo. Da Vinci and his drawings of helicopters and those sort of things. I, I think that futuristic portal is available in our minds and I think it depends on at that point where we put our energy. You know, do we think about the past? Do we um, you know, where our mind is is where our energy is and that's what we're going to create and see. So where are we tied to? Are we are we tied to now? Are we tied to our past? Do we review all these things in our past? Um, as old souls, sometimes we have seen things that aren't even of this century. Um, you know, and from the pirate days and the pirate ship days and Slave days, you know, those. I've seen those sort of things, and I'm like, wow, how can I get out of that era <laughs> and go a little more progressively into creating my world from the future? I, I don't know how to do that. I know, I believe it's available because people have talked about the Acacia Record, and everything is there. Well, I believe that library is available to all of us, but I don't know that we all recognize we can actually go to that library and look into the future. That part of Arizona uh, around Sedona and so forth uh, is somewhat famous for having portals to different uh, dimensions and possibly to different times. I know you and Kenny have talked about uh, Native Americans coming out of portals like that. Um, so that would be a connection with the past, I guess. There could also be portals to the future. I kind of wonder if things that come up from the earth um, in, in these vortexes that bring up things from the earth, they bring up things we imprint. Everything we touch, everything we do imprints something. So we're either cursing the world or blessing the world, and everything we touch, every place we walk, we have an energetic imprint. And for those that come after us that are sensitive to those energetic imprints, we can only visualize what comes out of our world that's in our mind. So I will see things in my own way of translating what is there, the imprint that's there. I'm going to close it in images out of my mind. You know, it's limited. Creativity is totally unlimited. 
but what's in our mind is limited from the past to the present day. So I think what comes up in those vortexes, the spirals that come up, are all about an imprint, an energetic imprint that's been laid down from experiences left behind. And I also think that's one reason people become hoarders of things from their past that's no longer, I can't get rid of that cup, that's no longer just a blue willow cup, that's Memo, okay? (laughs) (laughs) I know that Memo used that for, you know, her 60 years on earth. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to throw things away and get rid of things. Now, the younger generations behind you and I, Lee, I don't know that they're having that same sort of imprint because the memories attached to things are a little different. We're doing things different. We're actually getting rid of stuff, and we're getting we're passing on and cleaning out these imprints, and you could call them ghosts in the closet. We've all got tons of them. And we're real picky about getting, you know, oh, my God, I can't take that bag to the Goodwill because whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all attached to it some way to understanding that this imprinting of energetic imprinting happened. I just don't know that we've ever been trained on how to maintain it, let it go or do something with it. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't taught that. I was just taught, you know, our earthly discipline and maintaining, but not at that second level of but they didn't know either. My folks, my family, my clan did not know what to do with that either, except keep it because you might need it. <laughs> so <laughs> Yes. <laughs> In the uh, in the two minutes we have left, Janice, I wanted to uh, mention the fact that you had taken that you were given a gift of seeing things in nature uh, that are uh, supernatural, and that you photographed a lot of things, including the Hurricane Katrina, which is a little picture which we're putting up again on the on the website. Um, what uh, do you suppose those uh, visions are um, the kind of footprints that um, the other world leaves in our world? You know, as we're leaving our body, Lee, a lot of things happen. Um, and one of those things is a crying out to not be alone. Anybody that can hear me, help me, be with me. I don't want to be alone when I die. So I think that photo came out of whoever can hear me, I'm sending out that, you know, that information. And You mean all the people that died in the hurricane? Yes. Mm. Yes. And, and anywhere else. We, we, um, as we're leaving our body, many things can happen. You've experienced, uh, honey dripping, you know, in the air, sweetness, as, you know, in the hospital when someone was leaving their body. Yes. Um, but there's many things that, that happen when we leave our body, and one of those is, I don't want to be alone, and you're crying out for whoever, whoever on God's green earth can hear me. Mm. And the only NDE stories I've heard that re- reflect a, a bad, what they call a distressing NDE, are those people who feel like they're being isolated or cut off from the love of God. Janice, I'm afraid we're out of time for today. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing this story about your parents and Hurricane Katrina. Um, and for the folks out there, if you'd like to listen again to this or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org. And for more information about the work of IANDS, check out that website, IANDS.org. And while you're there, look for information about our upcoming annual conference in Denver this summer. And tune in next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening. <laughs>